Yes, hello. I'm Hazel Lundbeck. I have lived in America for about 50 years, but originally I was born in, in 1924 in 79 Seymour Road, Leighton, E10. And I actually lived and grew up there. Um, in fact, my brother was born there in 1920, 1920 yes, when my, my mother and sister had moved in during World War I while my father was overseas. <clears throat> okay, so um, were your family originally from Leighton? Oh, my family came from, uh, well, all Londoners. They weren't originally in London. They had lived in Bow and Tottenham and uh, all over the east end of London. And as I say, I, <clears throat> I grew up there, spent my childhood. Uh, in fact, actually, apart from three years in the Wrens, I lived there all my life until I was married. <laughs> and. Uh, were you, do you know where you were born, when you were born at home? Were you born in the front room, would you think, or your mother's? Oh, I would have been born in the, in the born, no doubt, in the large bedroom, at the first bedroom. Um, <clears throat> they were, we lived in an upstairs apartment, and uh, as you went in, you went straight up the flight of stairs. If you turned left at the top of the stairs, you found yourself on a small landing where there would have been uh, a little wardrobe and dressing table. And on your right hand side, as you went along that landing, uh, there was the large bedroom that my parents had. And then if you went straight ahead, there was what we called the front room. Other people might call the parlor. It was a large room overlooking the street and was quite a, quite a nice sized room, had uh, lots of furniture, piano and all the, the normal three-piece suite. And actually my brother slept in there in a chair bed all his life because there were only two bedrooms. If you came back to the top of the stairs and then went through down the long corridor that faced you, the first door you came to on your left was the small bed, which we called the small bedroom, which I shared with my sister all my life. The next door was what we called the scullery, and in it was a, on the left hand side as you went through the door, was a very large iron, ga uh, coal fired uh, big boiler that people heated their laundry water in. And inside that, and further next to that was the toilet. We, there was no bathroom, of course, and uh, a sink, and also the gas stove on the other side of it, and a, a curving stairway down that led into the garden. And then the last one that faced you right at the end of the corridor <coughs> was our kitchen, living room, had a, also had a, that, when I was young, it had a big coal fire range in it and a, a big dresser. And of course there we ate our meals and we had an easy chair around the fire and, uh, and uh, spent uh, most of our time in the house in there. That was looking over the allotment. Yes, we were very lucky. We were on one of the outside streets of the square and we didn't look into another street. We looked into over the allotments, which was quite a large field of individual allotments. And then on the left hand side of that, there was a football field, which was behind the local pub. And that was on, of course, Lee Bridge Road. What was um, the name of the pub, do you remember? Yes, the, the <laughs> name of the pub was the Hare and Hounds. And uh, it was, of course, much, much acquainted by the uh, local men. And uh, <clears throat> as I say, we grew up there, we played in the street. And uh, we were, it was a very nice time. All, most of the families had children and we all seemed to be much of an age within sort of four years. So we were a good big group of boys and girls. And uh, we played in the street. There were very few cars owned uh, in the, the uh, 
in the flats. One or two families had a car, but when we used to stretch our skipping rope from one side of the street to the other, they would slow down and wait for us to lower the rope onto the ground and then they would carefully drive over it and wave to us. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, all the, all the people who delivered goods at that time when I was young came with horses. The, uh, the milkman had a horse, the baker, the, the old man that used to come round with vegetables, they all had horse-drawn carts. Rag and bone man? Oh, the rag, <laughs> the rag and bone man came, yes. And on Sundays, we actually got a muffin man. And he came round <laughs> about just before it got dark in the winter. And he'd come round with a great big uh, flat wooden tray on his head, full of muffins. And he held on to that with one hand and he rang a big, like a big brass school bell with the other hand and he called out, Muffins, get your muffins! <laughs> and he'd ring his bell, you know. So Charles Dickens. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> and also, of course, the uh, ice cream men used to come. There was a, a light blue uh, carriage. They had a, a big, what of course, obviously, was an ice box. And, they both uh, um, drove a tricycle with the, the big uh, box was uh, attached in front because the children used to run out. And uh, there was one light blue one called Dicky Birds and the dark blue one was just called Walls's, Walls Ice Cream. And they were very good, you know, if you went out and you didn't have a penny, maybe you had a halfpenny, they'd cut a penny ice cream in half for you. <laughs> So they were very popular. And as I say, we played a lot in the street, mostly with balls. Uh, <clears throat> the walls uh, uh, along the end gardens had a small edge on them, and we used to bounce to catch the balls and pay penny tuppence. So you moved out, you used to get 12 pennies, and then you had to move out to the shilling line. <laughs> and we played that endlessly. Everyone walked around with a ball. And then uh, we were lucky again because down the very end of our street, past where the Warner Flats finished and then down another sort of road, stone road, we had what were called the marshes and they spread for miles so we always had green fields to play on. So we, we had good, good times there and then uh, Finally, of course, we grew up. Right? We were, all went to local schools, so we all knew each other in the school. And uh, we uh, finally grew up. And uh, What were some of the, you told us last time, what were some of the um, families? It's one of the questions. Do you remember any other families' names? Oh, the other fa Oh, yes. Well, of course, as I say, we, people didn't move about so much then. You know, uh, we grew up from the time we were big enough to go out in the street, went to school, finished school, the families were all the same. There were, uh, <clears throat> there were, the, uh, it was Evelyn Barton, and there, there was uh, <clears throat> the Mercers, Hilda Cross. Uh, there were so many names that I remember, Bobby Peacock, <laughs> and, and uh, Cliff Rudling, and of course there were my brother and myself, Hazel and Arthur Gregory, and there were, we all sort of played together, went to school together, and it, it was a good time. We, we were very lucky, we had a very sort of calm life there. There were never, never heard of a break-in or anything like that, or trouble with, trouble with neighbours quarrelling, you know, it was, very, very easy when I look back, a very calm sort of life we grew up in. Until the war arrived, of course. <laughs> we we uh, used to go away on vacations for um, in the summer. Of course, my father used to get, I think, uh, two weeks usually. He was a printer and uh, <clears throat> Other men sort of, I don't know what all of them worked out, but you see them going out in the morning. They were all carefully dressed. They used to go to the end to Leverage Road to get buses to where they worked. My father, 
I think had about a half hour ride on the bus to get to where he worked in a big printing company, Waterloo's. And uh, finally my brother was apprenticed also as a printer. And uh, uh, I think other men mostly worked in offices and uh, things like that, you know. Uh, and they, uh, they were all law, very law abiding and uh, liked things to be quite nice. And the, you know, the, the flats outside always looked very nice. They had a nice red tiled front gate and uh, the two front doors were under a nice arch. And there were uh, <clears throat> a hedge all the way along the front, little front gardens, which were nothing. And uh, also scrolled ironwork all along in front of the hedges. That disappeared during the Second World War, of course. <laughs> but they, they, it was all very neat and it was always nicely, nicely kept. The roads were swept, of course, and, uh, and people kept, the places were kept nicely. So... Uh, how are people, um, how, how are Warner Flats seen? How are they viewed by people, do you think? I'm sorry? How are Warner Flats, if you had a Warner Flat, like how was that seen? Was it considered a really nice place to Oh, uh, Warner Flats were very working class. Uh, um, <clears throat> they made a good area. They were well away from any slums or anything like that. And they were considered just decent homes for working class people. Yeah. People didn't, have, there wasn't the money about then very often, of course, to save for homes. But occasionally one of the families, I think the Tuckers with the, uh, they had a, <clears throat> two daughters, Joyce and Doris, and their son Roy was a very good artist. And he was going to the art school. And uh, they finally moved away and bought a house, and everybody thought that was tremendous, you know. <laughs> a house of their own was what everyone would have liked, you know. Uh, but uh, m mostly... Except your father. My father didn't want the response. He didn't like the idea of a mortgage. He, he, he didn't seem to mind paying rent, but he didn't like the idea of a big mortgage behind him, so we never moved. But, uh, Do you have uh, any idea what the rent was then? I, I really don't. It was pretty low. I think it, it could have been something like 12 shillings a week or something, you know. I mean, I, I really don't have a great notion of it as a child. It was just something my parents took care of and like, never entered my mind. When, of course, my brother and I started to work, we naturally gave up money at home for our keep. That was understood. Everyone did that. You you earned money and then you turned it over and they gave you back money for your fare if you had a fare and, and uh, you know, a little money in your pocket to buy buy stuff. And But the basic part went to help the family income. And uh, But of course we, we always used to go away on nice vacations every year. All right, my father would do that. And, uh, and so, as I say, until the war came, uh, and then, of course, we uh, had a, an air raid shelter put in the garden, our little garden that we shared with the family downstairs. And what were their names? The, that was, there was a woman there, <coughs> Mrs. Penfound, and she had three daughters, Hilda, Ethel, and the youngest one, not much older than me, was Olive. And uh, we shared the, air, the uh, air raid shelter with them, and we all slept together down there. They had a, a bed that went across half of the, the shelter at the far end, and we had bunks either side at the near end, near the door. <laughs> and as soon as the air raid siren went, we usually got, got home and had our evening meal and then the, the siren used to go and we all used to troop down there and sleep. And we used to take the dog with us and the cat, I think. <laughs> my, my, my stepmother would be rounding up the dog. As a matter of fact, she was rounding it up one night and a bomb came down 
not so much really near us, but but across an open space. So we got a lot of the blast, and where she was hanging onto the do handle of the back door, calling in the dog from the garden, and uh, she was blown up and down the stairs a couple of times. So wow. that was something. And we've had our, had our windows blown up, but we were lucky, you know, very lucky. We didn't get a lot of damage done. And in fact, in that whole square of apartments, there was no damage from bombing. We had it nearby, you know, but we, it, n none of the Warner flats got damaged by bobbing. So I think there was one street that did. I think I saw it on Alpha. Oh, I never, I never heard of it. No, Maybe I that was when you were in the Wrens by then. Or something. I don't know. I may have been in the Wrens by then, you know, but I would have thought that I would yeah. have heard about yeah. it. But uh, I mean, I, I was trying to remember the name of the streets. We were Seymour. The next one was Moyer. I think either Blocks Hall came next and then Kettlebest Baston and then the last one which was another end one like we were was Perth and uh, it, uh, um, in the road uh, Perth where it ended onto Lee Bridge Road like they, where they all did uh, was a, a sweet shop and the little infant school that I started when I was five so can you remember um well, I know you can remember some. Tell us all the uh, local shops and pubs you can remember around there. Well, <clears throat> we had, from our street on, uh, going further uh, out along the ends of the other streets of, of the Warner Flats, which, all, as I say, all came into Lee Bridge Road. I think on the end, at the end of our street, on the right-hand side, was a barber's. On the other side there was a laundry. Going first along was what we called the oil shop. It was a little shop that had uh, uh, tools and oil, paraffin oil and all that sort of thing. And there was a baker's. And Do you remember any of the names, Roy? No, I don't really remember the name. We just called it the oil shop. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a baker's and a dairy. And then as I say, the what you you call here we call here a candy shop but we always called the sweet shop and uh, you could get a whole lot of sweets in there for a penny you know and uh, if you went if you went for a errand for either your own parents or a neighbor but then maybe you know when you were old enough to be able to go onto the main road and walk walk a block the neighbour might ask you to go and pick up something and you always got a penny for going. So of course it always finished up at the, at the, at the last road because that's where the sweet shop was. So we had, as I say, it, it, was, it seemed to be a gentle time when we were, when we were young. And easy. We were used to it. We were used to it. We knew all the roads, you know. There was a, a sort of Sunday school. There was a hall on one of the roads, and I, I don't know which one it was, probably Kettle Baston. And uh, we had meetings, there were a Sunday school there, you know, the ladies used to hold a Sunday school. My father's attitude was, <laughs> you can go if you like to, and you needn't go if you don't want to. So we were a bit all and off about it, you know. But I used to go sometimes when all my friends were collecting these nice texts they used to give out, so I used to go and get those. I, uh, that was about my attendance. Like biblical texts, you mean? Biblical texts, you, yes, you, sometimes you get. And they were usually sort of made of celluloid, so you could keep them. Sometimes they were the paper ones, but occasionally you get a nice celluloid cross, you know. And, and I used to stuff them all into my Bible, which I never read, but. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> Actually, as I say, there was no damage, as far as I know, in the. <clears throat> in the area of the Warner Flats <clears throat> and it, it uh, apart from sleeping in the shelters and things like that you know it, it didn't hit us children so much but the women had a hard time with ration books and endless queuing for food I mean you, you never knew how long you were going to be up queuing in the in the at the butcher shop you know and maybe before you get there they would fry out things and, but they were very good, they made, made do and, uh, you know, if they came home and 
had uh, managed to get a, <coughs> a a can of corned beef or something, and and uh, and I learned to hate that because when I went into the service, we got it so often we used to throw it out. <laughs> When I came home on leave, I used to feel quite embarrassed because they were so pleased with, to get one. But um, as I say, you went through, we had a, um, a railway not far from us, which of course they used to run guns at, along. And so there was a great deal of noise at night, you know, and uh, things ha uh, happened, you know, sometimes people would go up to their house or apartment and to go to the bathroom or something like that and at that instant they'd get hit or at that instant maybe the shelter would get hit you know all sorts of strange things were going on my my uh, brother's good friend also apprenticed like he was uh, went home <coughs> one afternoon after a day raid and discovered that his house was gone and his mother was dead and it was very terrible some of the things you heard obviously you know uh, someone else, a warden, ducked into a, a shop because he heard a plane coming well, very loud. This was the person who lived downstairs, their border, right? Was hey, this oh yes, that's border? right, yes. The people downstairs, <clears throat> uh, their border was an uh, ARP man. And uh, he was on duty one night and uh, uh, he could hear the plane flying very low, coming sort of level with the Leverage Road. And he thought, if he drops one, I'm, I'm right in, in line for the blast. And he ducked into a, a shop doorway. But it kept coming and coming, and he sort of thought, well, maybe it's gone over. He looked out, and that's when the blast came and just decapitated him. You know, it, it was very dreadful, but there was so much going on. There was so much going on. I remember my uncle was in <clears throat> one of the rescue squads. I had an uncle in the rescue squad. And he always told the story about <clears throat> they went to a house in a, in a sort of more, I won't say slummy, but in a sort of older, more decrepit place in London. And, it, it, and a couple of houses had been bombed and come down. And they were calling out to see if anyone was still alive. So um, they heard a voice and the old lady called, I'm in here, I'm in here. So they dug and dug <clears throat> and they got her out. And the blast and everything, you know, she was half naked and they pulled her out to you. You okay, lady, you okay? And she said, I, uh, will one of you get my Sunday hat? It's under the stairs. <laughs> and that's all she was really worried about. <laughs> and he often laughed at that. He said, you know, he said, I couldn't believe it. All she was interested in was her Sunday hat. So, Tell the story of you and Auntie Pearl fire watching. Oh, yes. Yeah, all sorts of funny things happened. <clears throat> my, daughter, my sister by this time was <clears throat> married. And uh, her husband was in, in Africa by that time. I don't know if it was by that time. But anyway, he was away in the army. And when, she, when it was her fire watching turn, and we all had a turn to fire watch, well, I have another funny story to tell you too. I went round to her house. I used to go round to keep her company while she was fire watching. Which was also a Warner flat. Also, she was in a Warner flat over by the school. I think it was called Hitchham Road, that side. And uh, <clears throat> so we were sitting on the bottom of the stairs, you know, listening to the planes come over. And <clears throat> we had to watch for, we had to watch for the. Uh, the fire bombs because they did a lot of damage and needed to be reported right away. And so we were sitting there and <clears throat> the rule was that if there was ever an invasion, the church bells would ring. They never rang during the war except <clears throat> for a warning of a, they were told to ring if there was a notification of um, invasion anywhere. So we're sitting together, we've both got tin hats on, sitting on the bottom of the stairs. And uh, a bomb went off rather closely. And we both jumped. And then my sister said to me, Hazel, she said, a long way away, I think I can hear bells ringing. And I said, yes, I can hear that sound too. She said, you think we've been invaded? 
said, I don't know. I said, but it's a long way away. There's no local ones ringing. And we suddenly realised that as we, as we jumped, we'd hit our steel helmets together and they were going round and round and round with the sound. <laughs> so, and, uh, and then another, another time, what was I going to say? Um, I had another story to tell and I've forgotten it. However, it doesn't matter, it'll come to me. And, uh, Let's see. Um, as I see. Maybe let's go back to the schools a bit. Talk about what your, your the Leebridge school, what do you remember from the primary school, the first one? Oh, I started off, as I say, at the little infant school that was on the last, the end of the last street, the Leebridge end, Leebridge Road end of the, the last street of the other last street of the Warner Flats on Perth and uh, I started there just before I was five and uh, it was only up to the I think they only were they took the first two years after that you went to the junior school and uh, but um, we started off going there I can remember we, we had little square tables and there were four little chairs around and each one of us had a box to keep our crayons and things in and uh, the we learned we learned the alphabet um by what's the word i wrote, wrote? no no by uh, al uh, uh the way used by the sound Oh, phonetically. Phonetically, thank you. That's the word I wanted. We learned the alphabet phonetically and it was all round the walls. So we used to all sit there and say, ah, buh, buh. <laughs> <laughs> I said, but nevertheless, we learned to read very, quite quickly. And uh, I said, I can remember all those little kids, their faces sitting round, you know. I said, I went to, I went to uh, school, as I say, in the infant school. And uh, it was very enjoyable and we all got to know each other. Then we moved on to the junior school in Church Road. And then finally I went to Ruckholt. And I left Ruckholt at, just as I was coming up to 15 and the war started. But when I look back on memories, it was all a great childhood. And I enjoyed it and remember it with pleasure. I hope you enjoyed all the stuff I've told you. <laughs> I rambled a bit, but I hope you enjoyed it.